while they're dismissing, will you please turn in your Bibles to Romans in chapter 11, as well if you could open up, if you're able to do this, I know multitasking is a real challenge for some, but if you could open up to Deuteronomy 32 at the same time. So, and we'll only reference Deuteronomy 32 after we read our text and pray, but if you could kind of be ready uh, to go there right after we read our text in Romans chapter 11 this morning. The second one was Deuteronomy 32, and it'll be verse 21, actually. Uh, and again, that'll be for way, by way of explanation for something that we'll see here in our text. We are almost done with Israel. Almost finished. So, um, we're learning that God isn't finished, but God has set Israel aside. And so we're looking at the ramifications of that, really how that forgive the terminology, but how that shakes out in the church today. How we're supposed to focus uh, on ministry today. Christian, I'll be honest with you. I think that oftentimes in ignorance of Romans chapters 9-11 through 11, <coughs> has caused the church to invest in fruitless endeavors as well as to ignore great opportunities because of really misunderstanding what God is doing today. And I'll just say this as well. We ought to get excited about what God is doing. God's working in the world, and God has always worked in the world, has He not? Has there ever been a time when God has not been at work? There never has been. But the problem is sometimes we get distracted about how and where God is working. And if you're not working how and where God is, you're doing your own thing. And uh, God is on an altogether different program. That is, you're without power and purpose. And so it's good to know what God's doing. And I, this is a portion of the Scripture that I really settle you on that. So we've been focusing on the last couple of weeks, taking a little break for our revival services, our evangelistic services. Uh, but we're back in it, and we're going to conclude today by reading the final portion of Romans 11, beginning in verse 26. But our text this morning really will uh, pick up in verse 29. So let's, let's get our context beginning in verse 26. The Bible says... And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, There shall come out of Sion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. For as in time past ye have not believed God, or for as ye in times past have not believed God, yet now have obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed, that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. All the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Isn't that a great commentary on God? That's just, I mean, you could, you could just put that in any context that you're talking about God and you're learning about God and say, Oh, the depth of the riches and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. It isn't that God is making a mystery of himself. It's just that he's so much deeper and so much richer then we possess either the intellectual or even the spiritual ability to reach that plane of. Moving forward, for who hath known the mind of the Lord or who hath been His counselor? Answer, not a single person. Or who hath given to Him and it shall be recompensed unto Him again? Same answer. For of Him and through Him and to Him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. So be it. And this, of course, helps us by having an amen in this portion of the Scripture, helps us to understand that the Holy Spirit is done with this topic. And He's going to move into another portion in His outline in Romans. And so let's pray. And today, let's ask God to help us really to kind of um, not hammer a nail in a coffin, but have a final word on what God is doing with Israel and the church today. 
and what God is going to do in the future so that we can get involved with God's program, shall we? Father, thank You for Your Word. And thank You that You answer questions. We have many questions. And God, thank You that You're not a God who keeps everything a mystery and whose answer always is that uh, You're in control and You'll find out, but that You're a God that wants us to know what You're doing so that we can be involved in Your work. And Lord, it would be dangerous for us to think that our wisdom or our knowledge would be wise if it contradicts You. And it would be foolish for us to not get on board with one whose riches and whose wisdom and knowledge are past finding out, and yet the same God who is beyond comprehension reveals Himself. Thank You for Your Word which reveals You to us. I ask that You'll help us both to understand and to yield to it today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, so here we are. And really, Romans, beginning in chapter 8, we move into transition to talking about what is God doing with Israel and what is God doing with the church. And of course, it's an appropriate subject because this church at Rome is a mixed church. How did the church get started at Rome? Well, Paul didn't preach the gospel there. The church at Rome began when really what happened, what's described in Acts chapter 8 happened, that is that uh, the believers at Jerusalem, because of perse persecution, were scattered everywhere, and so they went everywhere preaching the word. At first they went to the regions surrounding Judah, Judah or Judea and Samaria, but ultimately they ended up in the uttermost part of the earth, one of those places being Rome. And Paul is writing at this time a letter to a church which he has never visited. When Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, hey, Paul knows where that church got it started because he's the first one. He and Luke and uh, and Aristarchus and a few others, first ones to preach the gospel there. Uh, but this church at Rome, Paul's never been to, and yet it's like this, the dream, if you will, tour that Paul wants to go on. He wants to preach the gospel at Rome to a church that he's never been to before. Paul writes to the church at Corinth, hey, he knows how the gospel got preached there. He preached it there. Thessalonica, Paul preached the gospel there. Uh, you know, and you could, you could read through Acts and see all the places that as an apostle... God had used him to preach the gospel, and yet he'd never been to church at Rome. This church at Rome is unique because how did the gospel get there? Well, believing Jews preached the gospel there. And now there are believing Gentiles, and one of the things that is causing a little friction in the church is that the believing Jews have an expectation that now the Gentiles will be just like me. And if somebody's going to be just like me, he's going to be ethnically Jewish. Well, the problem with that is that there are just some things that are not possible. And as well, there are some things that God does not require. And so throughout Romans, as this is a letter which is doctrinally helping believers really cement their understanding of what is absolutely necessary first for salvation. What is it God requires for salvation as well as what is it that what is the law good for? Because there's a real struggle to try to get the believing Gentiles to come under the law or to come into the law and uh, to conform with being Jewish, but they're not Jewish. And so Paul really, uh, by the help of the Holy Spirit, really dispenses with the notion that the law is part or parcel, any part, of salvation. And he actually uses a term which is a great one, I think ought to be, uh, used by believers more doctrinally when we describe salvation, the term that he introduces is the law of faith. The law of faith. And uh, he really emphasizes that it is not sa salvation is not through the works of the law, but it is by the law of faith. And he emphasizes using several illustrations, but the one that really jumps out at me and has really made a lasting impression on me and probably has made a lasting impression on you because of how repetitive I've been about it in preaching through the series is the illustration that God used of Moses and Abraham. See, the law, when we talk about it, is the law of... Say it. Who's the person God gave the law through? Okay, maybe it doesn't jump out at you yet. Let's be a little more repetitive. Moses. The law of... Moses. Moses, right? To whom did God give the law? Israel through Moses, right? So we call it the law of Moses or Moses' possessive law. The law that Moses gave. So when we're talking about the law, we're talking about the law of Moses. And uh, Paul just kind of dials things back to 
Genesis 15, which was penned, we know, uh, by the Holy Spirit using what human instrument? Moses, right? Moses wrote Genesis 15. And Moses, uh, Genesis 15 says that Abraham believed God and his faith was counted for righteousness. And Paul makes a simple point. He said, if Abraham believed God and his faith was counted for righteousness, that is, in conclusion, if Abraham were saved by faith and Abraham came before Moses and God used Moses to write about Abraham's faith, has salvation ever been by the law? Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified. But he then points out the advantages or the help of the law. The law exists. The Bible says, the Bible says, nevertheless, in, in chapter 5 of Romans, from Adam until Moses, death reigned, or death reigned from Adam until Moses. So people died without the law. Get it? Uh, so the law exists and it helps make sin exceedingly sinful, but the, the law doesn't cause death. What causes death? Sin does. Is there sin without Moses' law? Yes. Enough to kill you. But the law does exist to help to make sin exceeding sinful. In other words, uh, if you and I want to talk about, well, what is sin? We have a plethora of examples of what sin is by simply reading the law. I read the law, I'm like, whoops, 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 whoops. Uh-oh, another one, another one, another one, another one. Because the law exists to make sin exceeding sinful. Sin is sin because it's against God. There's a law of God written in our hearts. Our consciences can help. Have you ever known something was wrong without exactly knowing what God said about it? I have many times, haven't you? Matter of fact, people call me a lot of times and say, Pastor, i got a feeling about this, but I just wonder, you know, and they're seeking counsel. And it's interesting that oftentimes I know a verse. I'll say, well, this is what the Bible, ah, I knew it. They knew it. Why? How do they know it? Well, they have a conscience. They have a law in their heart that exists. And so without the law, people die, right? And why do people die? Because of sin. God told Adam about the fruit of the garden. He said, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt die. And we know that there is sin because we are spiritually dead as a result of it. So the effects of sin are present with or without the law. That's explained in Romans chapter 2, isn't it? So the Jews had the oracles of God, but the Gentiles had a law of God written in their hearts, knowing that there's sin. So how are we saved? Two words. By faith. faith. By faith. Salvation is, has been, always will be by faith. My friend... Uh, I don't mean to be controversial. I don't mean to put anybody or anything down. But a more complicated gospel is not the gospel that Jesus preached. Jesus illustrated the gospel by Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness. He said, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. In other words, to look at the brass serpent on the pole in the wilderness was to believe by faith what God said, that if you look to the serpent, you'll live. And the testimony of Exodus is that those that looked at the serpent lived, and those that did not look did not live. And the difference between those who lived and those who died was faith. And salvation, my friend, is by faith. It's that easy. Hey, could you preach a gospel by faith? Could you understand a gospel by faith? It's amazing sometimes. It's frustrating and actually makes me a little bit mad and I suspect God is more angry about it than I am that the gospel or that Christians sometimes have spiritual examinations for people who have simply received Jesus by faith. It's somewhat of a trend and I'm glad it's a passing one. This matter of lordship salvation. I'm glad it's a passing trend because it's dangerous. Because it endeavors to look at a person's life and to evaluate the fruit of a believer in order to determine whether or not they've actually received Jesus as their Savior. And my friend, I'll tell you what, yep, fruit inspectors. I'll tell you what determines whether or not someone has received Jesus as their Savior, whether they've looked to Him by faith. That's the Gospel. That's the Gospel. Okay. Shall we jump into our text today? We've been spending a little bit of time, and I said we're going to go to Deuteronomy 32, and that will take us right into our text today. And so Deuteronomy 32, 21, you're there, but I'm not. Now I am. Let's look at it. Verse 21, this is, this is referenced in 
uh, chapter 10, uh, as well as chapter 9. They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities, and I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. And here in Deuteronomy 32, we see in Moses' song that God gave him, we see in the middle of the song of Moses, God's saying that I'm going to provoke my people, Israel, to jealousy with a people that are not a nation, not a people. The Gentile, Gentile, Genoskinus, the word literally means other nations. That is not the nation of Israel, not God's called, chosen people, but just generic nations. So we've seen in the last couple of weeks what God is doing with the Gentile nations. We've seen that there is the branch or the root, the olive tree, and that is representative of God, and that the, off of the tree are, are the branches which have been cut off, and the, the, the branches to the olive tree that have been cut off are Israel. And we've seen that we, who are contrary or wild branches by nature, Gentiles, have been grafted in to that good tree. Now that's the opposite of good agricultural procedure. Good agricultural procedure takes a root or a branch which is strong, and then it takes branches, or it takes a root or a trunk which is strong, and it takes branches which are fruitful and plugs them in. Take, well, Israel is the good branches by the picture of the illustration, and the Gentile nation are the wild branches. Uh, I think it's really neat living in South Florida. I love citrus. Do anybody here like citrus as much as I do? I really enjoy citrus. And isn't it amazing the variety in citrus and in citrus development? It's incredible. Uh, the hybrids, the mixes. You know, most citrus trees are uh, wild lemon tree uh, roots. And then a good citrus tree that really produces good fruit has had good desirable characteristics fruits grafted into it. And so the branches have been grafted in. There's there's so many great combinations. I don't know about you, but I think my favorite orange is like is it like a honey bell. You may hear like honey bells. Aren't those delicious? Just like I mean the, the description is just about as good as it can get. They're bell shaped and they taste like honey. I mean they're just so good, so sweet, so succulent. And uh, then the varieties in lemons. I mean there are lemons that look like oranges. But they, you know, when you squeeze them, they just have so much good juice. It makes such great lemonade. And then I love lime trees. Man, some of the some of the developed uh, grapefruit. I like ruby red, but I've had some white white uh, grapefruit uh, that are just absolutely delicious, just as sweet as they can be. And uh, all of those trees, all of those branches, oftentimes are grafted into a good branch. And then they're sort of like, and I think this is a good description of us. The, you ever see a fruit salad tree? They call it a fruit salad. It's got it's citrus, but it'll have like a branch that produces lemons and a branch that produces oranges and a branch that produces grapefruit. As many as six different fruits grafted. You can get them at, at Home Depot or you can order them online. I need to get one for my house. If you get you one, get me one too, if you don't mind. Uh, but they're so cool. Right? And they'll, they'll oftentimes fruit at different times. So this branch will fruit this month and then this branch will fruit this month and it'll all be grafted into a lemon tree. And to me, I know we live in Florida, and I know uh, that Florida wasn't really part of the early church and so forth, but to me, that, that fruit salad tree really illustrates the church. Look at all the places that we're all from. I mean, we have some saved Jews. We have Gentiles from every nation and every kind from all around the world, all together part of God's family grafted in to this branch, and that's the church that God is using. It's a beautiful picture, actually, I think. And I should probably have one in my yard just to illustrate the gospel and the church, you know, and to eat the fruit from. Moving forward. Okay, so we saw last two weeks ago, we saw God's conclusion was that so all Israel shall be saved. And there's a reference to Isaiah 29, 14, Jeremiah 32, 36 to 38, Ezekiel 36, 26. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. In other words, prophecies that there's going to come from Zion and deliver. And of course, Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of all those pro each of those prophecies. It would help if you were in all services because we've been preaching from Isaiah on Wednesday nights. And a lot of the things that are covered in Romans 8 through 11 are in Isaiah. 
And it would help if you were here Sunday evenings because we've been preaching from Revelation and we get to see the fulfillment of all Israel being saved. We actually have. We've seen God numbering the nations, the 12 tribes, 144,000. And all of those nations that collectively have received the seal of God on their forehead uh, have, are the, uh, and the ones who are singing Moses' song of deliverance and the song of the Lamb, that's Israel collectively all being saved. All right, we're in our text this morning. I've got 10 minutes left probably uh, of, of probably your good or best attention span this morning. And so I'll do my best to try to get a few points across in that amount of time uh, so we can finish up talking about Israel and then move to the conclusion of what we're supposed to do because of what we know. When we get, while we're making our conclusion, let me begin it by stating, or when we're, we're stating our material, let me begin it by stating one of the things that we ought to be impressed by is God's program and God's time. The day is going to come when all Israel is going to be saved. The day is not today that all Israel is saved. When we say all Israel, we're talking collectively as a nation. We're talking about every person in Israel. There has never been a time when all Israel has been saved up to this point. There have been times when the nation of Israel have represented God and His law. But do you know that the children of Israel whom God delivered from Egypt, if you study the Scripture closely, the majority of them were not believers in God. How is it that when Moses erected a serpent in the wilderness, the, there were individuals in that nation that would not look to it? How is it that they would not look to it? I'll tell you why. Because they did not have faith in God. And they were distinguished oftentimes through God's judgment. See, God uh, delivered Israel because of His promises to them because the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. But that did not mean that all Israel was saved. But there is going to come a time and a day when all Israel is going to be saved. And what a wonderful time that is. But my friend, I want to say it is as well as I possibly can, as good English as I possibly can. It ain't today. Because God is using the church today. And so let's look at what God's doing. Verse 29, we see the first point I want to make today. And uh, it is simply that the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. The Bible says in verse 29 that for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Now, I'm not preaching Calvinism today. I'm not a Calvinist. I reject uh, Calvin and all his friends. Don't like any of them. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm, a, I'm a Jesus follower, my friend. I, don't, I won't apologize uh, for being a little harsh or unkind about Calvinism. It's, it's a wicked doctrine. And truthfully, a person who, who believes Calvinism uh, doesn't believe the gospel. And I don't know how else to put it than that. And so I don't know whether, you know, most Calvinists that I know were saved and then became Calvinists. And uh, they're just apostate believers. But a person who believes in salvation, uh, Calvin's way, and I don't want to get into it because it really uh, isn't, isn't what's in the Scripture and isn't what our text is and what we're preaching today. However, the Bible says that the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. Uh, does the Bible say in verse 29 that God never repents? No. I don't want to get controversial today, but God has repented of evil, but He's never repented of good. And by evil, I do not mean that God is going to sin, but I'm talking about God's judgment, evil being imminent judgment. God has repented of evil, but God has never repented of good. God's never made a good promise, a good covenant. By the way, the God's covenants that are being referred to here are unconditional covenants. In other words, Israel today is cast aside because there are conditions to some of the Abrahamic, Mosaic, Davidic, etc. covenants. Isn't that so? In other words, God said, if this is what you'll do, then this is what I do. But if you do this, then this is what I'll do. Captivity is a result of a conditional covenant. But regarding Israel and God's one day working through Israel, and actually God's kingdom being a Jewish or Israeli kingdom one day, my friend, was unconditional. And as a result of that, the Bible says the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. You'll get off, you'll stray into strange doctrines when you take the gifts and calling of God are without repentance and you make a universal statement that fits every context. The Bible says gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Has God given good things to Israel? Good promises? Yes. Has God called Israel to things that are extra special or particular to that nation? And the answer is yes. Has God turned back from what He said? Isn't this a wonderful truth for the poor Jews and the congregation who have been told over and over and over again many times, you're wrong! This is what God is doing. Now, God says to them, but God has never taken back what He's promised He'll do. That's verse, 20, verse 29. Isn't that a wonderful promise? Is it verse 19 or 29? I mix it up. Uh, verse 29. 
Okay, so that's our first point today. What God has said He'll do with Israel, He's going to do, but it is a future event, not a present event. And so if you're today making a lot out of Israel, uh, by the way, I don't mean to be anti-Semitic in this. It's not an anti-Semitic statement. But I believe that today many Christians are more focused on what God is doing in Israel than what God is doing in the church. And that's true. There are Christians who are just fascinated with Israel and what God is doing in Israel. Now, friend, let me just help you to understand something that God is doing with Israel today. Here's what God is doing with Israel today. I'm going to say it in one word. Nothing. One word to summarize what God is doing in Israel today. Nothing. Because God today is working in His church. It's amazing that much Bible prophecy looks toward future events where God is going to use it. And by the way, that's fine, isn't it? Is it, is it appropriate and biblically prescribed? Hey, prescriptive, where's Charlie at? Oh, he's in junior church. I used his word. <laughs> is it prescriptive that we're to love Israel? Yes. Yes. Does Israel have a bright future? Yes. Yes. Does Israel have anything from God in the present? No. Not a bit. Not in the least bit. Christian, you and I have to be careful not to get distracted. There are many believers who have volumes of literature. They've got magazines and books, all kinds of things that they're studying about Israel. And they're not interested one bit with what God is doing in the church today. In other words, they're on their own program and they're not interested in what God is doing. So frustrating. It is so frustrating as a pastor to try to lead a church, not this church, but in general, when oftentimes people are focused on what God isn't doing today and they couldn't care in the least about what God is doing today. In present day at this church in Rome, there is something that is absolutely positively marvelous that God has done. He's brought a church of many nations to the capital of the world, which is even today known as one of the most pagan centers, one of the most anti-God cultures ever. And there is a thriving church that is literally empowered by God's Holy Spirit in Rome at the time that Paul writes this letter. What a marvelous thing it is that God is doing in the church. And yet there are people who are distracted by what God isn't doing. A Christian, you and I, there are many caveats where you and I fall into the same danger. That is, we're impressed with an organization or a concept or an idea, but it isn't what God says He's doing. And we're entirely unimpressed with what God is doing, actually. Could I introduce you to someone? God the Holy Spirit. He's in the world today, my friend. He's in the church today. He's in believers today. And He is going forth in power to enable the preaching of the Gospel and God's Word in order to see multitudes come to Jesus Christ. And most Christians couldn't care less about God the Holy Spirit and they couldn't care less about the church. It's just not such a big deal. And friend, I'll just tell you something. If you get excited about what God's doing, you're going to find out His ways, His riches, and His knowledge are so deep and so unsearchable and His ways are so past finding out that you're really glad God just showed them to you. Isn't that a wonderful truth? Okay, first point. Got a point done. It's time to quit, so let's try some more. In verse... 30 is an argument demonstrating that the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. For as, in, as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. God is not working through Israel today, but God is saving Jews today. God is not working through Israel today, but God is saving Jews. The word all Israel shall be saved is speaking nationally, inclusive of everyone in the nation. Today, not all Israel is saved, but I just want to tell you something. God is saving Jews the same as He always has. Jews get saved the same as anyone else, and I think in proportion to anyone else. 
The problem is we're distracted by their Jewishness. And we're distracted by Israel, and we're not focusing on the church. And here the point is that, hey, all Israel is going to be saved. But I'll just tell you, the benefit is that while you received benefits, did Gentiles ever benefit from Israel when God was working through Israel? Hey, I'd like to introduce you to a fellow named Nebuchadnezzar. I'd like to introduce you to a fellow named Darius. I'd like to introduce you to a lady named uh, Rahab, to a lady named Ruth, to Tamar. I'd like to introduce you to literally scores of proselytes who have come to God through Israel. And today I'd like to introduce you, or I could introduce you to many believers who are Israel according to the flesh, but have come to God through Christ and are part of His church. The church is God's plan today, and anyone who comes to God through His plan today will come through the church. My friend, you and I ought to wholeheartedly reject the concepts of Messianic Christianity on the very basis of the fact that it negates Romans 9, 10, 11. So you say, Pastor, what's so terrible about you know people emphasizing their Jewishness? Well, there's nothing terrible about it. It just isn't what God's doing. <laughs> so what's so wonderful about something God isn't involved in? That's the real question, isn't it? What is so wonderful about something God isn't involved in? I found that the Messianic congregations have been a real distraction to the church and have focused more on pagan Jude Judaica, Judaism, which is paganism. Judaism is paganism as practice. You don't, the, most of the things that are practiced in Judaism are not found anywhere in, God, in the Scripture. That's why they don't make any sense to you when you hear about things that, that happen, the, the feasts and a lot of things that are kept. They're just not in the Bible. They de-emphasize the law and they emphasize Judaism. And the Messianic Church today, and I'm just being a little bit blistering, I guess, in some of the, my statements today, but I don't mind because it's true. The Messianic congregations today emphasize pagan Judaism and de-emphasize the church wholeheartedly. And, you know, you say, Pastor, what's wrong with that? Well, there's nothing right with it. First, so what's wrong with it? Well, everything. What's right with it? Nothing. Because it's not what God's doing. And we need to get on board with what God is doing. Does that make sense? In other words, you wonder why we're powerless. It's because we have our own plan. And God has a plan that He's empowered by His Spirit. What is wrong with the thinking of an individual who would re reject God's plan and God's way and instead substitute something or anything else? Well, everything's wrong with that kind of thinking. That's what. Okay? That wasn't nice. Let's move forward. It's true, though, wasn't it? In verse 32, the Bible says, For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that He might have mercy upon all. Isn't that wonderful? God's concluded them nationally in unbelief so that He can have mercy on everybody in every nation. 33. Oh, the depth. I mean, you think, you know, you ever see an episode where somebody, you know, this is what they should do, but they don't do it? You ever play a chess game with a really good chess player? Uh, I enjoy the game of chess. I've never really gotten to play against anybody really good. But occasionally I've watched some guys that are really good play chess. And I'm always amazed because they don't do what makes sense sometimes. What they do puts somebody in check way faster than anything else that makes sense. So as we look at it, well, why doesn't God do? Well, because He's just way more intelligent than that, if you'd like to know why. And when you look at what God's doing, why has God turned aside Israel? Why has God cast them aside? Well, because of unbelief, according to Romans. But in casting them aside, because of unbelief, God opens His arms so that everyone can believe. Well, that's kind of a good move, isn't it? Checkmate. You like it? You should. God's ways are it's like, wow, so much better. And we want to go back to, well, God should do it this way. No, not really. God's ways are better than ours. We see the question of who's known the mind of the Lord Answer: no one. Who hath been His counselor? Would you like to give God advice about something? I think the closest anyone's ever come is when Moses urged God not to destroy all of Israel and raise up a seed from His name simply because of the testimony of God. In other words, he appealed to God's character and His mercy and the, and the testimony of His name. And that was a pretty... God, God received that, didn't He? From Moses. Who made Moses? Gave him the wisdom? God did. 
So there wasn't anything that came from Moses. But if you want to use an example, that's the thing that kind of jumps into my mind. So the real answer to the question is, who has been in God's counsel? Or who does God seek counsel from? You know, God hasn't recently called me and said, Ryan, I just don't know what's going on with people. I just don't understand this millennials. Could you please? No, God knows people, right? You may not understand millennials, but God does. Ask God about them, He'll tell you. That's a joke in case some of y'all are starting to get wonder what I'm talking about or getting offended about it. Uh, millennials are a joke. Verse 34. <laughs> I got to get in my jabs while there's still some of us left who are not part of that generation. <laughs> that was funny. Andrew, suck it up, Buttercup. It's all good, right? Not a millennial anyway, so get on. He rejects his generation and all their propensities. Okay, moving forward. <laughs> okay, moving on. Sorry, guys. Does anybody have anything that they've given to God first? In other words, has God gotten anything that He's given us? No. What do you have? What do you have? You think about it. Are you talented? Who gave it to you? Are you wealthy? Where'd you get it? And you don't have anything that you haven't first gotten from God. But God doesn't have anything which He has first gotten from us. So how much can we teach or instruct God? This is a really kind way of saying God doesn't need us. God isn't impressed by us. And if you think that you can instruct Him, you are arrogant, arrogant beyond belief and disillusioned. The Bible says, For of Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever. And Paul says, Amen. In conclusion today, I want us to dial back and remember the way Paul introduced specifically Israel. Remember when Paul said, my heart's desire and prayer for Israel is that they might be saved in chapter 10. Remember in chapter 9 when he said that I could wish myself a curse from God for my kinsmen according to the flesh. And he's saying these things to urge a people who have gotten a little bit of a bent or an edge against him because they think that he loves the Gentiles and doesn't love his own people. And Paul says, listen, if my people nationally could be saved, I'd go to hell. That's a pretty strong statement of devotion. He said, my heart's desire, literally my heartbeat, is that Israel would be saved. That's what my heart beats. But now he's looked at explaining God's plan of what God is doing through the church. And Paul's conclusion is amen. Amen. And friend, if you and I are going to be effectively used of God, the word amen literally means something like, let it be so or may it be so, this is my heart. My heart is God's heart. And Paul here said, I'm on board with God. He's better. His ways are better. His plans are better. Sign me up. How about you? Is God better? Are His ways better? Are His plans be better? Have you signed up? Let's say amen. 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 Father, thank you for what you've taught us from your word today. And Lord, we love it. God, not because we're smart or because we approve, but because you are so beyond us, so much better than us. And I pray that you would confirm in our hearts what we've learned from your scriptures. We ask in Jesus' name. We're going to have an invitation today, and I don't know specifically what the invitation is. The invitation is always, if God's spoken to you, would you do business with Him? It may be that specifically today you don't know whether or not you've come to God by faith. And friend, it's pretty simple to do so. And that could be the invitation for you here today. God, I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I know I'm a sinner. And I believe that He's the only means for salvation. And I want to, by faith, receive Him. Amen to the Gospel plan. So be it. I want it in my life. If that's you, even during the invitation, I have Brother Taj standing at the back, and you could just go and say, hey, I prayed to be saved, or I want to pray to trust Jesus as my Savior, and you could respond that way in the invitation. For everyone else, it may be that God just opened a little bit of a door 
maybe a little bit of a light went on, you saw something from a perspective that you hadn't seen before. Well, it's a really good idea when God's spoken to you to receive it and just say, hey, amen. I think the invitation really was at the end of, of the passage when Paul said, amen, I said, amen, and everyone here said, amen. If that's so, you've responded in the invitation. Maybe just cement it with a few words and uh, pray for God's help understanding. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation today so that you can be led as God wants you to. We're going to open to page 242 in the blue hymn books. If you're physically able to do so, let's stand. Let's sing, Jesus, I come. Jesus, I come. If you believe what God said, well, then let your heart uh, be His heart. Jesus, I come. Out of my bondage, sorrow and night, Jesus, I come. Jesus, I come. Into thy freedom, gladness and light. Jesus, I come to arrogant pride. Verse 3. Out of unrest and arrogant pride Jesus I come Jesus I come into my blessed will to abide Jesus I come to each of you here today. I hope that you're able to physically, if you're able to do so, I hope that you're able to be here tonight at 6 p.m. and be praying for the folks that aren't here this morning. This is the strangest winter ever in South Florida that I can remember with regard to sickness. I mean, so many people are sick and it's just been a winter for it. I don't understand it, uh, but don't get me sick. That's all I can say about that. But be praying uh, for a number of folks. Brother Lee is not able to be here this morning, and Timothy, and quite a few other folks as well. So you may miss some faces. Be praying for them to, to get back, snap back from this. I don't know if it's a virus or a flu or whatever keeps going around with everyone. But, uh, yeah, lots, it is. It's a rough one. It's everywhere. It's random. But uh, pray for those folks. And uh, if you could be here this evening, you will sure, surely be fed by God's Word. We've really enjoyed being in Revelation the last seven weeks. Father, we thank You for meeting with us here today. We're so thankful that Your Spirit is with us, the Spirit of Christ manifested. Lord, I just pray that uh, You would go with us today. Lord, help us not to get so caught up in the, in the activities of the day that we forget that everything that we do is supposed to be for You and that we forget what, you, what it is that You're doing. Lord, I pray that You would allow this church, these people, to be influential for the gospel. I pray that you would help us because of our understanding of the truth and because of the power of your word and the power of your spirit to effectively preach the gospel to those that we uh, cross paths with. And I pray that we would deliberately cross paths with more people so we could preach the gospel more effectively as well. Thank you so much for what you're doing. We praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.